We've got the we've got the Levushians. Are ready to begin? Um, on a couple of can you imagine? We're holding Daf Chav Zayin Amid Bay is the last line on the bottom. Just like the waters test her, in other words, that if she is guilty, she will be affected by them, so the waters inspect him as well. So the Gemara asks, Who is this him? If we should say that it means the husband, now whatever is going to happen to the wife is also going to happen to the husband. Bow my of it. Husband didn't do anything wrong. Why should he be punished? He famous is pay oven bad kilemaya. And if you want to tell me that it means that if he has a sin on his record, the waters will affect him. And now she says that which type of sin are we talking about? That after she violated his warning, and he should have brought her then to the base hamikdash and have her tested with the waters of Satan. And in the meantime, he went and lived with her which he shouldn't have. So then the waters will affect him in the way they were supposed to affect her. So if you want to tell me that, if he has a sin on his record, will the waters be effective for her? We said that just like the waters will affect her, they will affect him. But if he has a sin on his record, meaning if he lived with her after, after she violated his warning, then the waters won't affect her at all. So it can't be talking about that. But Tanya, didn't we learn in the Brais of Anika Ishmael Avain? It says the man will be clean from sin. But Isha Hitis Avain, that woman should bear her sin, which means Ms. Mansha Ish Menukamei Avain Mayim Beit Kedes Yishtei. Only if the man is clean from sin do the waters inspect his wife. Ain't no Ish Menukamei Avain, but if the man is not clean from sin, ain't a Mayim Beit Kedes Yishtei, then the waters don't affect the wife. So it can't be referring to the husband. So who is the Oisa? Who is the him that is affected negatively by the waters? Ella it must be the Ella Lebayil. It must be the, the suspected adulterer. So if she is found guilty by the waters, the waters find her guilty, and therefore she gets the effect of the waters. So whatever happens to her happens to the adulterer wherever he is. If that's the case, then listening to the Katana Sefer. In the Mishnah, we had two cases, right? We had a mission, we had the case of Hashem Shamayim Bait Kenoisa, Kachamayim Bait Kenoisoi. And then it said, Just like she's forbidden to the husband, she's forbidden in the long term to the suspected adulterer. So the question is, the Mishnah knows how to refer to the suspected adulterer. We call him a bayil. We don't call him him. So why in the first part of the mission does it say, Why doesn't it say, Just like in the second part of the mission, it refers to the suspected adulterer as a bayil. And for the Gemara, really, it's referring to the Baal. When it says, I say, it means the adulterer. The Reisha, in the beginning of the Mishnah, I did the Tane Isa, since it refers to the wife as Isa, Tane Isa, therefore it refers to the adulterer as Isa. Isa, as opposed to Isa. Seifa, I did the Tane Baal, I did the Tane Baal, but in the second part of the Mishnah, since it refers to the husband as the Baal, Therefore, it refers to the adulterer as opposed to the husband as the bayil. So when we use the term oisa, we juxtapose it with oisai. When we turn, use the term baal, we juxtapose it with bayil. But it refers to the same person. It said in the Mishnah, Shanem bo bo. How do we know that the waters will affect the bayil also, not just the, the isha, not just the woman? Shem shamayim bayit ken oisa, kachamayim bayit ken oisai. We know this from uvo uvo. The Talmud Yeshiva had a shaila. How does the Gemara, how does the Mishnah learn from Bo'u Ubo'u that just like the waters affect her, they also affect him? Is it from the extra Vav that it could have said Bo'u and it says Uvo'u? <coughs> the fact that it says Uvo'u in the Pasuk. Toshma, come in here, I'll answer your question. Says, Kishem Shasur Second part of the Mishnah is that just like she's forbidden to the husband, 
until she proves her innocence, shows she's also forbidden long term to the suspected adulterer. Shenemar, as it says in the Pasik, Nitma Vin Nitma. So in the second part of the Mishnah, it says Nitma Vin Nitma. Says the Gemara about dying Tiboi, I'll still have a question. Nitma vin nitma eka amar. Nitma nitma eka amar. Ay nitma vin nitma eka amar. Is it the fact that it says twice nitma, or is it the fact that it could have said nitma and it says vin nitma? Tashma, come in here, I'll answer your question. Midr Katani Seifa, since it says further in the Mishnah. Rebbe ye mishnei pa mimha amura beparsha vin nitma vin nitma. Echad l'ba'al v'echad l'ba'yo. The Rebbe says when it says twice in the parsha, v'nitma v'nitma. One time it refers to the ba'al and one time it refers to the ba'yo. And the Rebbe disagrees with Rebbe Kiva. Miklal the Rebbe Kiva v'avi kadarish. So that 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 leads us that gives us the clue that Rebbe Kiva, who is the first opinion quoted in the Mishnah, must derive it from the extra vav. Or else, what's the machlek is between Rebbe and Rebbe Kiva? Rebbe Kiva derives it from the fact that it could have said nitma and it says vin nitma. And Rebbe derives it from the fact that it could have said that it says twice nitma. As he says clearly, shnei pamim hamurim beparsha nitma of a nitma. Now, um, if that's the case, then when the first part of the Mishnah where it says that how do we know that the waters will affect him because it says bo bo, it also means the same thing, that it could have said bo and it says uva u. So just like nitma, vin nitma, means it could have said nitma, but it says vin nitma. So bo, bo, means it could have said bo, and it says ubo. So that teaches us, yeshem shasur al-baal, kachasur al-baal. Hilkach, therefore, le Rebbe Kiva shite So it turns out that according to Rebbe Kiva, we have six psukim. It says three times in the Pasuk, uvo, ubo, hamayim. The waters will come into her. And each time it could have said bo, and it says uvo. And Rebbe Kiva learns from the extra vava, extra halach. So according to Rebbe Kiva, you have six psukim in total. Three times bo and three extra vavs. That's a total of six. So one pasuk is Hashem decreeing that the waters should do their job. The second pasuk is Hashem informing the woman that you should know what's going to happen is first your belly is going to is going to uh, is going to extend itself until it explodes, and then your thighs will fall. In other words, the, the, uh, the manner in which the water, the water is drunk by her, and as it descends through her body, it will affect different parts of her body in, in the proper order. First, it will come to her stomach, and then it will come to her, to her thighs. Because it says, um, it, said in, it says in one Pasuk, it says about the thighs first. And the Gemara explained the reason why it says the thighs first, because the thighs began with the Aveda, therefore the punishment of the thighs is mentioned first. But nevertheless, when it actually happens, it happens in the order that the water descends through her body. So the Torah has to tell you, not to give out a bad name on the, on the, on the Mayim Hamarim. You should, know what to, you should know what to expect. So one Pasuk we have, the Torah is decreeing that this should happen. The other is telling you that the order is going to be first the stomach and then the thighs. And the third pasuk is to inform you that this is what's going to happen. So we have Tzavo is instructing the waters to do this. Asiya, that, that it's actually going to happen. So Titus is telling you that this is what's actually going to happen. And Yediyah is that you should know that the order is going to be first the Betan and then the Yarif. So according to the Bakiru, we have six psukim. So one is the, the instruction of Hashem to the waters, the decree of Hashem to the waters that they should affect the woman. And one is instructing the waters to affect the man, the adulterer. One to inform her, to inform us that this is going to happen to her. And one to inform us this is going to happen to him. One for her to know that the order is going to be first the stomach and then the thighs. And one for him to know that the order is going to be like that. So, so from the whole caboodle, we learn that everything that's going to happen to the woman is also going to happen to the man. That is according to Rebbe Kiva, who interprets the vavs. The Rebbe, but Rebbe, who doesn't interpret vavs, plus a Rebbe will say, we have three psukim here. 
Chad l'tzavor, v'chad l'asiyah, v'chad l'yadiyah. One is an instruction from Hashem to the waters that they should do this job. One is that it's actually going to happen. And one is that we should know that this, the stomach's going to be first and then the thighs. Rebbe, g'shem shamayim, beit kenei sakach, beit kenei semi nolet. So how does Rebbe know that the waters are going to affect the adulterer as well, not just the woman? Nafkalei the tanya. He learns it up from the following, <coughs> from the way the following b'raisa learns it up. It says in the b'raisa, says in the Pasuk, lats beis betem, to make the stomach explode, velan pil yarech, to make the thighs fall. Bit, so it doesn't say bitna, her stomach, or yerecha, her thigh. It says betan v'yarech. Bitna v'yerecha shal bayil. It must be referring to the stomach and the thighs of the adulterer. Ata emer bitna v'yerecha shal bayil. You're telling me that it means the stomach and the thighs of the adulterer, of the man. Ayeyne el bitna v'yerecha shal nivelis. Maybe it's referring to the woman. Shal emer v'tzav sa bitna v'naf lo yerecha. When it says in another passage that her stomach will be extended and her thighs will fall. Ari bitna v'yerecha shal nivelis amur. So the woman's already covered. We already told you what's going to happen to the woman. So why does it say in another Pasuk to make the stomach extend itself and the thigh fall? It doesn't say whose. That comes to teach you. Also the stomach and the thigh of the man, of the adulterer. So the question is back on the Bakiva who has six psukim and he's covered everything from his six times six times um, it's up so bet uh, six times ubo. What, what what does he do with the pasuk? Lots base bet and milan to yarech. Yes, the gemara who the made all okay in the bet and bereisha v'had the yarech. That's just to inform her that first the stomach is going to be affected and then the thighs. So the hitzi laz on my mamarim not to give out a bad name on the bitter waters. Frek the gemara ve'idas. If you need the pasuk, lots base bet and milan to yarech to tell you what the order is going to be. So how can Rabbi Shmo, how can how can Rebbe learn from that pasuk that it, it refers to the man, not just the woman? It could have said in this pasuk also. It could have said bitna v'yerecha. In other words, just the fact, just to tell you that first is going to be the stomach and then and then the thigh would have been covered if it would have said lots base bitna v'lantul yerecha. My betan v'yarech. Why does it say lots base betan v'lantul yarech? The fact that the Teda chose to express it in this specific way teaches us that the man will also be affected. If you're learning from this Pasuk, that the man will also be affected, so how can you learn from this Pasuk also something else, that the order is going to be in this way? Maybe the whole Pasuk is there only to teach you that the, hus- that the, that the adulterer will also be affected. If the Teda wanted to tell us just the fact that the, the adulterer is also going to be affected this way. It should have said his stomach and his thigh. My betan v'yarech. Why does it just say that in, in, a, in a neutral way, a stomach and a thigh without saying whose stomach and whose thigh? Shmami tarti. From here we learn both things. Inside the Torah wants to tell you that the, the man will also be affected, not just the woman. It also wants to tell you that you should know that the order is going to be first the stomach and then the thigh. Amar Bishua. It said in the Mishnah, Rabbi Shua said, This is the way Zechariah ben Akatsev used to interpret this passage. So we have three psukim in Pasha Saita that say pretty much the same thing. Im nitma, if she became tame, nitma, she became tame, vin nitma, and she became tame. So why does it have to repeat this word nitma three times? Echad lebal, one comes to tell you that she becomes forbidden to the husband until she proves her innocence. Echad lebal, one to tell you that she becomes forbidden to the adulterer. Echad letruma, and one to tell you that if she's the daughter of a kain or even married to a kain, once this suspicion comes upon her, until she uh, proves her innocence with drinking the waters of Saita, she'll be forever forbidden to eat truma. This is the opinion of Rebbe Kiva. So the three psukim, one tells you she's forbidden to the husband, one pasuk is forbidden to the bayo, and one pasuk that she is forbidden to eat truma. <clears throat> this is the opinion of Rebbe Kiva. I'm Rebbe Shmuel, so Rebbe Shmuel says, Kal v'chaymer. I don't need a pasuk to tell you, tell me this. I learned it from a Kal v'chaymer. What's the Kal v'chaymer? Ma'a grusha. A daughter of a kayin who married a Yisrael. And then she was divorced. And she has no children from the Yisrael. So the Torah says, Bas Kain Kisi Almano Grusha, 
a daughter of a kain who becomes either widowed or divorced, the Zera Eila, she has no children from her husband who was not a kain. So the Shavel Beisavia Kinureha, she can return to her father's household as in her youth. Ilechem Abiha Teichel, she can eat from the bread of her father. What is the bread of her father? The bread of her father is Truma. Her father's a kain. <clears throat> so it's explicit in the Pasuk that a Grusha, a divorcee, who is the daughter of a kain, if she has no children, she can eat Truma after she's divorced. Now we know that a Grusha is forbidden to marry a kain. So we see that it's possible for someone to be forbidden to marry a kain, and nevertheless, she's permitted to eat Truma. So we make a kalvachaymer. If a grusha, a divorcee, a daughter of a kain who became a divorcee, who is forbidden to marry a kain, nevertheless, she can eat truma. Just the other, sorry. If a grusha, a divorcee, who is permitted to eat truma, nevertheless, is forbidden to marry a kain, zusha suru betruma in edin shasura lakuna. So the saita who is forbidden from eating truma, plus she proves her innocence, is surely forbidden to a kain. So if the husband is to die now, she will not be allowed to marry a kain. And what, what's his question? No one said otherwise. Man is going to ask that. Ma Talmud leimar vihi nitma vihi nitma. Why does it say in the pasuk and she was tummy? She did become tummy. She did become tummy. Im nitma. If you know for sure that she became tummy, lama shaisa. What's the point of her drinking? If you know for sure she didn't become Tomei, Lama Mashka, why are we giving her to drink? So what does this mean? Imnitma and Leinitma. Magid Lachakasa, the Tate is trying to tell you here, Shah Safik Asura, that even though we don't know whether she was defiled or not, until proven, until she proves her innocence, a Safik is forbidden. And from here we learn that the same halacha would apply in the case of a Sheretz. A Sheretz, a, 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 an insect, which, is, which makes you Tomei. If you're doubtful whether or not the Sheretz, you came in contact with the Sheretz, you walked pl- by a place where there was a Sheretz, and you're not sure if you touched it or not. Or an object was, was next to a Sheretz, and we don't know if the Sheretz touched the object, it didn't touch the object. So we make a, a simple cheshbit. Uma seite, if a seite, shaloi also bashege kemezi, where the Torah does not <clears throat> make a, a, an un, unintentional situation, the same as an intentional situation. In other words, if a, if a, if a seita became a seita unintentionally, she's not going to become forbidden to her husband. But Enes Kedatsin, the Torah did not make a forced situation the same as a, willing, a, a willful situation. Right? If she was forced, she's not going to become Aser. Nevertheless, Aser Basafik Kivadai, nevertheless, the Torah made a doubtful situation equal to a for sure situation. The fact that there's, she's suspicious adulteress makes her as forbidden as a sure adulteress unless, until she proves her innocence in this circumstance. So sheretz, she also bashege kemezid ve'enis keratz, and so on. Sheretz, an insect, uh, who, who where the Torah makes an unintentional contact with a sheretz makes you tame just as much as an intentional contact does. And if somebody by force took a sheretz and put, placed it on you and made you tame, you're just as tame as if you, if you did it willfully. So so obviously sheretz is more severe than soita. Because by Saita, we don't, we don't uh, make a Shegig the same as an as Amazing, and we don't make an Anus the same as, as Ratz. But by Sheretz, we do. So, in a Din Shi Yasab of Suffolk of Adai. So, surely by a Sheretz, by, surely by a surely by a Sheretz, a Suffolk should be the same as a Vadai. So, if you're unsure, there's a possibility that you came in contact with a Sheretz, but you're unsure, then surely it should be the same as if you're sure. It, you, you are tummy. We learn this from Saita. And if by Saita, where Shegig is not the same as Mezid, and Enus is not the same as, as Ratzin, nevertheless, Suffolk is the same as Vadai. So by Sheretz, where Shegig is like Mezid, and Enus is like, Enus is like Ratzin, then surely a doubtful contact with the Sheretz is considered like a for sure contact with the Sheretz. Umimakim Shabbos, you have to bear in mind where you're coming from and you have to know that this only applies in circumstances that are similar to where you're coming from. Just like the Saita, the, the experience of the Saita would, ne- would normally have happened in a private place. So this halacha that we have by a Sheretz, that even a doubtful contact with a Sheretz makes you Tomei, only applies if it happened in a, in a private place, in a private domain. 
But if it happened in the street, then a doubtful contact with the sheretz does not make you tummy, because the seita only applies in Rishus Hayachid. So we learned this halacha from seita, so it only applies in cases which are similar to seita. And another, another similarity to seita that has to apply in order for this din to work is a seita is a person, a human being, which you can ask her what happened. Similarly, if a person, if, 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 if I'm in a case of doubtful contact with the Sheretz, it would only make you tame if it was a human being that had doubtful, doubtful contact with the Sheretz. Someone who you can ask, do you know what happened? Do you not know what happened? You can discuss it with them. But an object that has no mouth, has no ability to speak, and has no mind, and you can, you can ask him what happened, the din of Suffolk Kivadai does not apply. So when do we say that doubtful contact with the Sheretz is the same as, as sure contact with the Sheretz? Only in a case where, first of all, it was an Rishus HaYachid, and second of all, it was a human being who has Das Lishoel. We can't Amru from here, and we can't Amru from here, Chachamim said, Dabar Shiyash Be Das Lishoel, Rishus HaYachid, Sveket Yamek, something which has a mind that can be asked what happened, and there was a case of doubtful contact with something that made it tummy. In a private domain, the suffix is tummy. In a public domain, a suffix is toher. If you're dealing with an object that has no mind and can't be asked what happened, like a, a, a vessel or some food that came in doubtful contact with a sheretz, whether it was in a yachad or a rabim, the doubtful case is toher. Yeah? Correct the the Rebbe Yishmael, go, let's go back to our Braise for a minute. We had a conversation in our Braise between Rebbe Kiva and Rebbe Yishmael. Yeah, Rebbe Kiva says we have three psukim, nitma, im nitma, vin nitma, nitma. And since we have three psukim, we learn three halachas from the three psukim. One is that she's forbidden to the husband until she proves her innocence. One is that she's for, in the long term forbidden to the adulterer. And the third is that she's forbidden to eat truma. Yeah, comes along Rebbe Yishmael and says, I don't need your pasik. I can learn it from a Kabachaim. If a grusha is forbidden to a Kayin, even though she's allowed to eat truma, so a Saita who's forbidden to eat truma is surely forbidden to a Kayin. Yeah? Did the Bakiva say anything about a Kayin? The Bakiva didn't say anything about her marrying a Kayin or not marrying a Kayin. So why does Rabbi Shmuel come along and say, hey, one minute, I don't need your pasik, I can do it from a Kabachaim? The Bakiva wasn't talking about Kuhuna. So the Gemara asks now, Rabbi Shmuel, Omer Rabbi Kiva Truma Mahadur Le'iu Kuhuna. This conversation between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Kiva doesn't seem to make any sense. Rabbi Kiva is speaking about Truma, and Rabbi Shmuel is responding to him about Kuhuna. Besu, in addition to this, Rabbi Kiva Kuhuna Minale. And interestingly enough, let's ask that question. Rabbi Kiva has three psukim. One he learns Baal, one he learns Baal, and one he learns Truma from. Where does Rabbi Kiva know that a Saita whose husband died before she drank the waters of Saita is forbidden to marry a Kain? And if you're going to tell me that Rabbi Kiva is of the opinion that we don't need a Pasuk for Kuhuna, because once the Torah establishes that in the Dinam of Saita, a Suffolk Zayna is equal to a Zayna, and the Torah already told me that a Kain is not allowed to marry a Zayna, so once a Suffolk Zayna becomes equal to a Zayna, we don't need any more Psukim to forbid her to a Kain. Where do we see that the Pasuk makes her as a Zayna? No, it says, Im nitma, im nitma. even though we're not sure what happened, we still answer her to the husband as if though we knew what happened. In, right? In the meantime. In the meantime. Right, so. We're talking in the meantime. So if the husband dies before she has a chance to prove her innocence, can she marry a Kayan now? She comes along to Arav and she says, listen, I'm a widow. Before I became widowed, I was suspected of adultery. Nothing ever happened. Right. Yeah, may I marry a Kayan? So the din is that since she was in a position where the Torah considered Suffolk Zaina Kizaina, the Torah considered her to be guilty in the and she did not prove her innocence because she never drank the waters of Satan. So now she cannot marry a Kayan. She doesn't even need a Pasuk. It's an obvious thing. Then until she proves her innocence, she's forbidden to marry a Kayan. Because the Torah says that a Kayan is not allowed to marry a Zaina. If, so if that's the Rebbe Kiva's opinion, that, that you don't need a Pasuk to answer her to a Kayin, 
because asa basaf exayna kezayna. So truma nami leiti boikra shari asa basaf exayna kezayna. So you shouldn't need a pasuk for truma either, because a zayna is not allowed to eat truma. We learned it from a pasuk of Askei and Kisiel each zar. He b'truma sakadashim loisa, from which the chachamim derived that zar, someone who's zar law, someone who no business living with her, lived with her, then she is forbidden from eating truma. And if a, if a zayna is forbidden, from eating truma, I think zayna is also forbidden from eating truma. So we have two questions here. One question is, what's the conversation between Rabbi, Sh- Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Shmuel? Rabbi Kiva is speaking about Truma, and suddenly Rabbi Shmuel flies in with Kahuna. And second of all, once Rabbi, once Rabbi Shmuel brought up the subject of Kahuna, it makes us curious to know where would Rabbi Kiva learn that, um, that, that, that uh, where would Rabbi Kiva have learned from that she's usher to Kahuna? And it can't say that he learned it from the fact that Suffolk Zaina is Kazaina, because if that's the case, he wouldn't need a pasuk for truma either. Elo the Rabbi Kiva are bo'akroixim. So we have to say that according to Rabbi Kiva, we're actually dealing here with four psukim. What are, what are the four psukim? Because we have nitma'a, we have twice nitma'a and once vinitma'a. And according to Rabbi Kiva, the vav is like an extra pasuk. So we have twice nitma'a, once vinitma'a, which counts for two. So we have four psukim according to the Bakiv. And if we have four psukim, then chad le baal, the chad le boil, the chad le kuna, the chad le trum. We use one to learn that she's forbidden to the baal, one to tell us that she's forbidden to the boil, one to tell us that she's forbidden to a kayin if the husband dies before she drinks, and one to tell us that until she proves her innocence, she's forbidden to meeting trum. Rabbi Shmuel, Tlosik Roiksi, but Rabbi Shmuel does not hold that we can learn it from above like it's an extra pasuk. So Rabbi Shmuel, according to him, there's only three psukim. Chad l'baal, v'chad l'bayl, v'chad l'truma. One, we learn that she's forbidden to the husband. One, we learn that she's forbidden to the adulterer. And one, we learn that she's forbidden to eat truma. Kahuna asya mekal b'chaymer. And we learn kahuna from a kal b'chaymer. If she's forbidden from eating truma, despite the fact that a grusha may eat truma, then surely she's forbidden to a kain, which a grusha is forbidden to. So we don't need a pasuk, according to Rabbi Shmuel, for kahuna, because we learn kahuna from Akal Bechaymer. Correct the Gemara. The Pasuk doesn't say nitma, nitma, vin nitma. The Pasuk doesn't say what she's forbidden. It's just a, it's, it's a, it's a generic Pasuk, nitma. You have to guess what the, what the prohibition is. So you guessed one time Baal, one time Baal, and then one time you guessed Truma. 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 Who tells you that the Pasuk is coming to tell you that she's forbidden from eating Truma? And then you can derive a kalbachemer that she's forbidden for kahuna as well. Maybe the Pasuk is telling you that she's forbidden to a kayin. And truma, which we said, decided is more lenient than kahuna. Maybe she's allowed to eat truma. Amar Lach, the Bishmol will answer you. It makes sense to me that if I have three psukim and each Pasuk is telling me another prohibition, it makes sense to say that the third prohibition is similar to the first two. What are the first two? The first two is she's forbidden to the husband. And the second is that she's forbidden to the adulterer, the boy. Right? Now, she can't be forbidden to the husband once the husband dies. Right? So when we say that she's forbidden to the husband, it means while the husband's still alive. So ma balo bail me chayim. Just like the case of Baal Bail, must be talking about a case where the husband is alive. So then the third, the third nitma probably also comes to, to exclude her, to forbid her for something which she can do when the husband is alive. And that could only be truma. Because when, when, when the husband is alive, it's questionable whether she can have truma. Whether she can marry a kayin, the husband is alive, she surely can't marry a kayin. Because one of two things, either the husband is alive and married to her, and therefore the kain she can't marry because she can't be married to two husbands at once. Or the husband divorced her, and then she's a divorcee, you can't marry a kain anyway. The only possibility for her to marry a kain is only if the husband dies. So just like the first nitma, which applied to that she's forbidden to the husband, was applicable while the husband is alive, so the third nitma should also be applicable while the husband is alive. And therefore, Rabbi Shmuel says it makes more sense to say that the third nitma comes to forbid her from eating truma.
Lafuke kahuna no lachar misa, which excludes kahuna, which can only apply once the husband passes away. So if that's the case, how does Rebbe Kiva respond to that? Rebbe Kiva needs four psukim. One for Baal, one for Baal, one for Truma, one for Kahuna. Kahuna, that, that doesn't apply while the husband is alive. So it's not Dumi the Baal Baal. And for the Gemara, Dumi the Baal Baal, less lay. Rebbe Kiva will say that I don't buy that, that um, way of thinking. That just like the first nitma is talking about while the husband is alive, so the last nitma is talking about the husband is alive. Not necessarily. One can be talking about a case where the husband is alive, and the other one can be talking about the husband's not alive. Inami islay, and even if he holds that, and, and therefore Rabbi Kiva will say that if I only had three psukim, I would say Baal, Baal, and Kehuna, and Truma would be okay. Therefore, I have to have four psukim to tell me that Truma is also forbidden. Inami Islay, and even if you say Rebbe Kiva would go along with that way of thinking, and therefore he would have used the, the third Pasuk for Truma rather than Kehuna. But nevertheless, we need a fourth Pasuk. Why? Because we have a Klaal, that's something which you could derive from a Kalva The Torah sometimes gives you the extra, the extra source so that you should learn it from the Pasuk itself rather than learn it from a Kalva the Torah would prefer in certain cases that you should derive it from the Pasuk itself. And that's why the Pasuk tells you four psukim, nitma, nitma, vinitma. The vinitma counts like two. To tell you four halachas. One halacha is that she's forbidden to the husband. One halacha that she's forbidden to the adulterer. One halacha that she's forbidden from eating truma. And one halacha that she's forbidden to a kayin. And even though the fact that she's forbidden to a kayin could have very well been derived from a kalva chaymer, milsa de asim a kalva chaymer, tarach of lakra, something which could have been derived from a Kalva Chaymer, the Torah will go out of its way and tell you an extra, give you an extra source so that you can learn it directly from a Pasuk. And this concludes our shir. To be continued in Mitzvah tomorrow, if it works for everybody, 2 o'clock. Yeah, um, can I ask a question? I just want to confirm that it works for everybody, 2 o'clock. Yes, fine. thank you. Yes, fine. Okay, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, what fine. What happens if the, the adulterer has a uh, charata? Mm-hmm. He, he, he does to Shiva the best he can, and he begs the, uh, the Saita to confess, mm-hmm. knowing that he can't marry her, and it was a terrible mistake, they shouldn't have done it. Mm-hmm. She drinks. Is he still liable to death? A very interesting question you're asking. Very interesting question. The past, it would seem that if she drinks, then he will die. But um, maybe the punishment after, afterwards will be less. I, I, punishment in the other world, you mean? Yeah. yeah. yeah the other world, you can zikr tshuva, will zikr help. I mean, the same question you can ask if a person does an Aveda, which is high of Mrs. Bezdin. Yeah. There's a whole zikr from the Rebbe about this. In the look base. A person does an Aveda that is high of Mrs. Bezdin, and he does tshuva. So the Rebbe quotes from the Neid of Yehuda that for, for Bezdin shall matter, tshuva doesn't help. Because Bezna doesn't see into the heart. Bezna sees into your actions. Mm-hmm. If your actions show that you're guilty, they have to go ahead. Bezna from Ayla does, does accept Shuvah. So the question is, would this be considered a punishment coming from Bezna Shomata or from Bezna Shomayla? Very good question. I don't Thank know you. the answer. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. All the best. Yeah. Yeah.